From your favorite dietitian, everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Hello, and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. This next interview is with a good friend of mine, Ben Zeal. He is a registered dietitian as well. He's also an online nutrition coach. He's a strength and conditioning coach, and he specializes in helping people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. He himself grew up with type 1 diabetes, so not only does he have the credentials to back up all this information that he's about to share with us, but life experience, which I feel really helps to drive his points home and gives you a bigger perspective and understanding of how this disease can really affect someone's life. So without further ado, here's the interview with Ben Zeal. Enjoy. Hi, Ben. How are you? Hey, Tony. What is going on? Nothing. I'm so excited to talk with you. I'm so happy to be here as well. Yeah, we've had so many members from the mentorship come through. But everyone talks about something different, which I think is the coolest part about the mentorship and all the registered dietitians that are a part of it. Well, yeah, everyone's got their own thing and their own specialty, and mine is diabetes, and I am glad to talk all about that. Yeah, so why don't we just jump right in? Let everybody know kind of who you are. Um, Obviously, we know that you're a registered dietitian, um, but talk about your personal experience with diabetes and then why you chose to kind of go that route to help your clients. Awesome. So my name is Ben Zeal. I'm a registered dietitian, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and I will have had type 1 diabetes for 20 years in on Friday, which is oh. kind of insane. So it will be 20 years, and it's been quite the journey. I was diagnosed when I was seven. I've gone through everything you can imagine, whether it's sports and having like struggles with blood sugars, being active, Um, I've had challenges with trying to gain muscle. I've had challenges with trying to lose fat. Um, Just being an athlete in general and all of the blood sugar ups and downs and all the things that impact your blood sugar, there's been so many different factors. You feel like you're juggling all these balls all the time in the air. And so I said, you know what? I'm really passionate about nutrition. I started figuring out what worked for me. Um, I obviously became a strength coach because I loved training athletes and training like an athlete because I was one for so long. And then I figured, why not disseminate all this knowledge to the people with diabetes because they need to know it. And all of the info that we're given at the doctor is so outdated. It's Mm -hmm. beyond archaic. And it drives me crazy when they tell me something that I was told 20 years ago. So I want to give them the most updated info. And I just want to help as many people with diabetes, type 1 and type 2, as I possibly can. Yeah, because it's not a fun journey. Like it's something you have, especially type one, it's something you have to think about constantly. Type two, you, you should think about it constantly in the sense that you should be practicing managing it, but the symptoms aren't so kind of clear and obvious with type two. Um, so I noticed that a lot of people are kind of easier to kind of put it away, but with type one, you like have no choice, right? No, Type one, it's everything you're doing at, there's some portion of your brain. Like if your brain was a computer, like some portion of the bandwidth is being associated with your diabetes, whether it's Oh, I'm walking. You can go to the mall. I'm walking around the mall. Is this going to lower my blood sugar? What do I need to do with my insulin? Do I need a snack? What? Have, how long am I doing this for? What am I doing later? When is dinner coming? Did I take an inj- Like you're getting the idea. Your brain is just going. And even if you don't feel it all the time, like it's still running in the background and it, totally. it can be exhausting. It definitely can be. So maybe like, like tell people, tell our listeners a little bit more about you know, how you knew that you had diabetes, um, that whole start to you. And then I'm curious along the way, like, how, did you speak to dietitians? Did you speak to doctors? Like, I, like at what point, what age were you when you were just like, you know what, this isn't enough that I'm getting. I need to become a dietitian so I can teach people how to do this. Okay. Awesome. So when I was seven, I had just moved from Michigan to Wisconsin and I Therefore, then my, my parents' ideas, I became like a Viking and Twins fan from Minnesota because I hated Wisconsin because I literally got diabetes a month after moving. And I had been like losing a bunch of weight. I was thirsty all the time. I was peeing all the time. I just felt miserable. 
And I would go to a day camp and I would like, it was great. We'd be running around, but I'd feel just tired. Like we would do, we'd be like literally running for 30 minutes and I'd feel exhausted. And I'd be wondering why. And we went to Six Flags one day outside Chicago and my dad got a call from the children's hospital because he had suspected something might be going on. So he had had me get some labs done and they called and said, Ben has diabetes. And most kids end up in the ICU with a blood sugar in the 800s, 900s, 1000s. I was lucky. Mine was only, I think, 225. Oh, wow. So still good, but not ICU level and DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, which can be super, super scary and life-threatening. So mm-hmm. I was really fortunate for that. But then as I was growing up, they tell you the same basic things. I'd see dietitians every time I would see the endocrinologist. And they would say, have this many carbs per meal, this many carbs per snack. And it sometimes it worked and sometimes it wouldn't. They didn't talk about the types of carbs. They didn't talk about different things to consider. It was just the same basic three things over and over again. And so I was probably in high school and I started asking some more complex questions like, hey, I'm a baseball player. I want to know how to fuel for a game or versus for a practice. I noticed during games, my number goes higher and during practice, I don't. And they just kind of looked at me like I was speaking Greek. I'm like, something's going on here there's obviously a missing connection and then I wanted to like start strength training and getting stronger and I would ask for recommendations and they didn't have a whole lot that wasn't just general population stuff and at that point I started realizing there there needs to be more info out there and I would google there was nothing there I got into college and I really started digging into this and there was nothing at that point on the internet now there's plenty but there really wasn't that much. And even the stuff now it's better, but it's still not everything you need to know comprehensively. And so I figured, you know what, I want to just become that resource for people. And I've had this whole idea kind of marinating for probably the last like six, seven years, but it's finally happening now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's it's interesting. Like you didn't have the answers. So you found them and created them and now you're helping others do that, which is really, really cool. Um, I kind of wonder, like, I wonder if the reason why, and now it's getting more, the research is coming, you know, being is definitely, um, out there more, it's more readily available, like you said. And I feel like, because probably not a lot of people question the doctors, you know, like, I feel like you're probably the one of the very few that was just like, can I have more information? (laughs) Um, and so that's really, really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, so, okay. So from there, you became a, obviously became a dietitian yourself and now your business is online nutrition coaching as well. Um, and so when someone first comes to you, what are kind of like the misconceptions that they've heard about how to treat their diabetes and how do you kind of break through them? So one of the things I hear all the time is that people are just terrified of carbs Because everybody focuses on carbs from the moment you're diagnosed. Carbs, carbs, carbs. It's the only thing that impacts your blood sugar. You need to be really concerned. And so then people get to this point where they're eating like a keto or a lower carb diet simply because they're so afraid of eating a donut or mac and cheese or something that they actually want. Mm -hmm. And I have people saying like, hey, I miss eating fill in the blank food because I'm so afraid of having it. Mm -hmm. So I try to break that immediately because... I don't want people feeling like they can't eat certain foods just because they have diabetes. Like you have the ability to eat whatever you want if you are smart about how you go about doing it. Right. Exactly. And so how would someone do something like that? How would you break through? Yeah. Like if you, if you have, if you have diabetes and you've been told your entire life, you can't have carbohydrates and now you're trying to teach someone how to have it. Well, how would they fit that into their diet? So that would be something, I mean, we would obviously have a conversation about, okay, what kinds of foods are you missing? Or if someone was diagnosed later in life, oh, you really miss cupcakes. Okay. Well, what's, if you're, if you're a teenage kid and you're always told no, 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 what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go have some. So in this situation, it's similar. You just slowly introduce, but you have to be smart about how much you're introducing, when you're introducing, at what stage, because if you do it too early, they'll freak out. So you have to really know a lot of the the sequence of when to do it and when to appropriately Mm -hmm. like pull back or push forward. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why they're with me. So. Yeah. You're doing it under the care of someone who's certified and able to, to regulate you and also to tell you how much insulin to take. Well, that that's technically a little bit out of my scope. Um, but I mean, I can obviously, if they say, Hey, like I'm doing X, Y, and Z, I can say, well, if it were me, this is something I would consider. 
but I can't say take two units for this because that's right. That's more like that. right. that's more like once you're a certified diabetes educator, which I'm working towards, then you have a little more ability to do that. But until I become that, I can't technically. You technically, they're diagnosed. They're told how much insulin to take, and then you help their nutrition fit to that. I, I help their why well, in their case. I think I just build their nutrition from the foundation up. And then they take the insulin recommendation that their doctor gives them and they're able to adapt it around the nutrition, which ideally the nutrition is also helping with the insulin sensitivity anyway. Right. And then it's kind of, they're working hand in hand. Right. So that's a good point. So if someone improves their nutrition, you're saying that there's a potential that they won't need as much insulin. Um, I definitely, that would be, a, that's, that's, that's tough water that you're putting me in, but I would say there's a chance that, you could potentially reduce your insulin. There's also a chance, depending on what you're eating, it may go up. It really depends on what you're eating, the composition, but, um, and, and there's more factors. But I think the bigger thing to think about is when your nutrition's more locked in, your blood sugars are more likely to be locked in. And when those are more locked in, your insulin use will be more consistent and likely will trend downward, but it's not guaranteed it will trend gotcha. down. Gotcha. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's 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 like anything. It, it's more of like a domino effect. It doesn't necessarily mean one causes the other. It's just like, you know, if you, it's like you can't. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's just easier to manage. It's like someone who eats balanced throughout the day. They're less likely to binge eat on the weekends because they're eating throughout the day. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to lose weight or not lose weight depending on their action step. It's just like one change usually causes another change in a positive way. Oh, I mean, even with this, I've noticed and people will say, they'll be like, oh, my nutrition's locked in. My blood sugars have never been this good. And I'm like, that's because they go hand in hand. And if, and if their blood sugars are going good, it doesn't mean they're going to be locked in nutritionally. But usually you fix the nutrition domino, the blood sugars follow. And then once you throw exercise in there, if that and the nutrition are in there, the blood sugars, once you sort out any lows or highs from exercise, they're usually gold. I think one person out of everyone I've worked with has had their A1C, which is like the measure of how good your blood sugars have been over three months. One person's had their A1C go up, and that's because they didn't do anything I told them. <laughs> Every single person has had their A1C go down. And I would say most of the people's A1Cs are better than my own at this point. Wow. That's insane. And mine's pretty darn good. I'm not going to lie. Mine's pretty good. But a lot of these people are like, they're in the low sixes, high fives. It's insane. Right. So under seven means under good control. Under seven would be from um, a like a doctor's perspective, you're doing pretty well. But most of these people are in the high fives, low sixes. Nice. So it's, I think that part of it's pretty cool. But yes, to answer the question, nutrition, once that's locked in, that usually will, the blood sugars will get better as long as people actually do their end of it. Mm -hmm. So let's backtrack a little bit in the sense of like the difference between type one and type two. So I just want to kind of clarify that although with type one, you can keep, I'm wondering actually, let's clarify both ends with type one and type two, once you're diagnosed, you're diagnosed, but then there's theories with type two, you can technically reverse it, but with type one, you can't. Can you speak to that a little bit? How much into the weeds do you want me to get? Cause this is a question. <laughs> we, got, we got time. Go All right. On. Excellent. So type one is autoimmune. So your beta cells and your pancreas that make the insulin, there's a attack for some reason. People think it's triggered by an, like a virus, like you get sick and then a few months later it happens. But either way, your beta cells get destroyed. They no longer make insulin. You're on insulin the rest of your life. Type two is a little different. And it's typically because the people tend to be a little bit on the more robust, larger side of things. And so because of that, then their pancreas is working harder. So they're having to make more insulin, having to make more insulin to be able to handle the body's demands and the needs for it. And so when people say, oh, I'm pre-diabetic or, oh, I just got diagnosed with type two, their pancreas is still making insulin. So a lot of the time, if they're able to then lock in lifestyle habits, like the exercise and nutrition side of things a little more effectively, then they can reverse diabetes because once they lose some of that weight, their pancreas won't have to work as hard can go back to where it was and then suddenly they're living their life how they were the issue that comes into play for type two is if you let it work over capacity too long it'll start to burn out just like an engine and once your pancreas burns out it then won't make insulin and now you're an insulin dependent type two and you're going to need insulin the rest of your life wow okay that's the difference that was a great explanation 
that might be the best I've ever done. So I'm was, really glad you're recording this right that now. Was very good. Um, yeah, that was really, really good. Um, so that's where, why getting, getting, going to get blood work done annually. And if you're pre if you're told you're pre-diabetic, would you recommend every three months or every six months? What do you typically say? For blood work? Yeah. I mean, I would say you're probably okay every six months if you're pre-diabetic as long or as someone that the doctor said. Say that again? As long as you're doing something about it, right? Right. If you're, especially if you're intervening on it, I would hope that would be enough of a wake up call for someone to say, Hey, you should probably start to make some changes. Well, here's the thing. Like I, and it's not to scare people, but I do feel like because you don't always, you don't really, it's asymptomatic, meaning you, you don't feel the symptoms usually of someone when you're pre-diabetic. So although the thought is I would be scared and I'd want to do something about it, I find that unfortunately with most people, maybe they are like scared for about a month mm-hmm. and then they like forget and then they don't care. And then they're just like, oh, as long as I'm still in the pre-diabetic range, I can still go about my life. I don't think people understand like how life threatening diabetes can be when it becomes uncontrolled and if they don't establish those healthy habits first. So I usually don't try to get like, you know, morbid and dark and whatever, but I also feel like people do need a wake up call because it's a blessing that they don't have it, but because it's silent, it's like they can ignore it. And so I would love for you to just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that and even for people who are diagnosed with type one or just like, you know what, I'm in denial, I don't feel like dealing with it. And they don't take their insulin or they don't test their blood sugar and really pay attention to it. Like these complications ultimately are not pretty like down the road. And I'm not saying how fast you may or may not get it. Someone with prediabetes that may eventually manifest into type two diabetes may not feel these effects for a couple of years. But as things start to happen, like people do end up on dialysis and they people do and you always hear the story at least in my case in the type 1 community we always hear it oh you say you have diabetes and someone says my grandma had diabetes and her foot got chopped off or whatever which it's like first of all thanks for telling me that has no bearing on my life but more importantly like that is something that actually happens because your blood flow starts to get a little um i don't I'm thinking of the word i can't think of it but basically your blood flow is not as good it can't reach the extremities as well and ultimately a microvascular complication that's what it's called it's like the little vessels aren't going to be able to get as much blood they're not going to be able to heal if something gets infected it's going to take longer to heal and then it could eventually lead to amputations like people can lose their eyesight from it because again little blood vessels that have too much sugar floating around are ultimately going to damage it and your quality of life deteriorates and can deteriorate very quickly if it's left untreated yeah. if you don't do anything and it gets really expensive so people think oh well it's it's really pricey to to intervene on this now, I need to go buy a gym membership and maybe upgrade my nutrition, but you might spend a little extra now. Think about how much you might spend if you have to get your foot chopped off. Yeah. So spending in time, going back to dialysis, dialysis requires three to four hours of sitting tied up to a machine, three, usually two to three times a week, where you literally cannot do anything other than sit there for for three to four hours in a room of other people getting it done. And it's just not, it's, it's you you can't do a lot of things because if your dialysis is Tuesdays and Thursdays, you have to modify your diet and you can't do anything on those Tuesdays and Thursdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever schedule you're at. So, so you're losing time and literally quality of time. You obviously lose quality of lifetime in the sense of if you have, you know, complications, infections, wounds, not healing, and then you have to get amputees, like that sort of a thing. Um, but you are, you will lose money too. Like how much is insulin usually each month? That's a loaded question. You just asked again, you're full of them today. So insulin, no barrier. Like I have no, that's good. good. No filter. This is good. Um, That that works out because you're talking to the one person that will sound off about this too. So insulin right now is, I think the third or fourth most expensive liquid on the planet which is insane. So, I mean, per bottle, there are people spending over a thousand dollars per bottle of rapid acting. It's like a humor. How long would that last them? One bottle would probably last them. I know I get three bottles per month from insurance. So insurance thinks I get three bottles a month. So insurance covers what? Oh, insurance. In my case, I'm fortunate. I have solid insurance, so it covers most of it. 
But for some people, their insurance is bad or they have to hit a deductible or something like that. And they might be paying five, $600 a month just for the insulin, not for the syringes, not for the insulin pump, not for the infusion sets, not for the continuous glucose monitor, none of that. They're just paying the insulin. It could be five, $600 a month. Right. So when you add up everything else, you're probably spending a thousand dollars a month on at least. I know people that are spending two, three, four grand a month just on diabetes supplies, which is insane as it is. Yeah. Right. I, and and here's the thing, you really need it, right? So you oh, need yeah. to do that and it's it's obviously worth it to keep you alive. But if you know that there's potential, unfortunately, like Ben, you didn't have a choice, right? This is what happened to you and you had no choice, right? There, but there are people out there that have a choice. And I think the greatest thing about diabetes is that you actually have the ability to control it in a pretty like cause and effect type of way if you're working with the right professional, right? Versus right. unfortunate, some diseases like cancer, like we don't know what the body, we can believe, we can trust, we can do the best that we can. But unfortunately with a disease like that, it, it is unpredictable. And we have some control, but not 100% control. With diabetes, it's like, you have a disease that if you work really hard to incorporate these lifestyle changes, you're, you're like at a higher percentage of not getting it and not having to spend your money on, you know, just keeping you to, to, you know, to treating it. Well, and for the people with the, the pre-diabetes and the type two, with what you were saying, like they can say, Oh, well, this is so hard and this is so rough, but then think about you end up on dialysis. You're not having to modify your diet 10 times worse than you would have had to before and 10 yeah. times more intensely. Renal diabetic diets are the most complicated oh, poop in the world. <laughs> I'm trying not to curse. Like, I just remember being a dietitian and, and I felt so bad for the patients because I just like, they were told this one thing their whole lives. And like now they're basically told the opposite, but this, it's like insane. It's like being a keto vegan person. Like it's, you, you, Yes. It's very restrictive and exactly. it's not fun at all. So then not there's people all. that you can prevent that if you put that effort in and you're willing to put just that extra little effort. And I think a lot of people, like you said, they need that wake up call. And sometimes they don't see it until it's already affecting them and it's already too late. And they're like, well, now I'm going to intervene. And it's like, cool, but now it's, you're not going to be able to get back quite as much as you could have before. Right. Exactly. So just to pause a little bit, guys, if you're listening and you've been to the doctor or if you haven't gone to the doctor, go to the doctor, get a hemoglobin A1C. And if you find out that you're pre-diabetic, please reach out to Ben. Just middle, middle segue. Um, but changing gears a little bit, um, you did mention, so basically with people with diabetes, they don't have to fear carbs. They just need to know how to have, and I think this is the entire, di- this is like everyone in general. I think everyone in, diabetes, in general, but diabetes, especially. Yeah. Just, but like, I think everyone, right. We fear carbs. It's not about the, it's not about carbs. It's the type of carb, the amount and like the rest of your day and all of those things. Um, so that's kind of like stating the obvious, I would say. What I think is interesting, cause I've seen you post some stuff about it on your Instagram, um, is how maybe fats affect blood sugars and proteins affect blood sugars. So if you can go into that a little bit more, I would be really interested. This is what I like geeking out on. So this is perfect. So protein and fat, people always focus on carb as if it's the enemy, but protein and fat can have just as much of an impact on blood sugar as carbs can. And so with protein, typically if you have a ton of carbs at one time, if you have, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 plus grams, and you have a bunch of protein with it, the protein's not likely to affect it because think about from a metabolic perspective, carbs spare protein. So it spares protein breakdown. But on the flip side, if you don't have many carbs and you just eat like a bunch of chicken or a bunch of steak, there's a chance that hours later, or eggs or whey protein, I guess, but hours later, your blood sugar will start to slowly creep up because that protein's being broken down into glucose. Okay, and we so- need to repeat that. Yes. Like we need to segment that and put it for everybody that's ever tried a low carb diet <laughs> yeah. and just put it on repeat. Like, just like have everybody, if you are listening to this in your car, go back 30 seconds and re-listen to what Ben just said. You should put that on one of those YouTube videos. So that's like 10 hours of the same thing and just do it. <laughs> so, so basically yeah. just repeat. No, but seriously, repeat yeah. what you Dead. I would. So protein, when it's eaten, whether if there's not really a whole lot of carbs around it, so we're talking like lower carb diet people, 
Um, in that situation, at like hour, two, three hours later, your blood sugar will start to go up because the protein is converted. Some of it is converted into glucose. Right. And so basically, but when you have carbs and protein together, hashtag balance, right? Balance, balance, balance. Then that effect does not occur. It does not occur. And if it does, it's like a teeny little bit amount and it's not even worth noticing. But So carbs it, alone, usually if the wrong type of carbs are too many carbs, will spike blood sugars. Mm-hmm. Carbs and protein together usually regulate blood sugars. Protein alone with very little to no carbs won't affect it right away, but eventually the blood sugars will start to creep up. And it might be, you might see it an hour after, you might see it two hours after. It depends on the person. It depends on how much protein you've had. And is that related to type one or, or type two as well? Um, I definitely know it would be type one. I'd be curious. I don't have any data from someone who is type two who has like a continuous glucose monitor, but I'm fairly certain that it may not be as stark of an increase. Like if you gave a type one 70 grams of protein, you had them eat a bunch of eggs and some other stuff, they're going to eventually go up. But a type two, it may still go up, but it may not be quite as pronounced as a type one. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and like you said, the t- amount of protein, is it, if it's like a protein in excess or. I would say the amount of protein in terms of grams, if it's like, if it's 15 grams, it might affect you a little bit and you may not notice it, or it might just be, Oh, I went up 20 points. But if it's 25, 30, 40, 50 grams of protein, you will see an effect. I mean, that's pretty standard. I don't think most people are putting their food on a scale and they're usually getting like chicken cutlets that are they're, because they're not putting the carbs there, it's filling up half of their plate, which we know is like seven grams of protein. I mean, seven ounces of protein, which is like 56 grams or so. So that's really common for sure. Oh, 100%. And people need to be aware that that is something that does happen. And different kinds of protein, chicken versus fish versus whey protein versus eggs, will also affect you different. So I can tell you anecdotally from people I've worked with, um, eggs and whey protein, almost you need to insulin wise need to it needs to be a similar dose you have to figure out what works for you because you will just spike immediately because wow. of the type of protein so i mean there was actually a study that showed whey protein um elicited in non-diabetic people as much of a insulin response as white bread i'm mind blown right now i'm not i'm this is just things to consider like if you gave me a scoop of whey protein right now and told me to do nothing i'd watch my blood sugar go from my, i don't know what i am right now but I'd probably, if I'm a hundred, I'd go up to like 200 easy. Not a problem. But if you had it with some sort of carbohydrate, it wouldn't do that. Well, if I had it with a carb, I'd be dosing for the carb. So then it wouldn't be as pronounced. Oh, okay. I understand. Because if you had carbs, you'd be having insulin, but because you're not having carbs, you're not having insulin, but yet your blood sugars are still being affected. Well, I mean, ultimately with a lot of people I end up advising, and I, this is something obviously semi out of the scope of this, but I would advise considering some sort of insulin strategy for protein, because if you don't, you will end up with blood sugars that are high very unnecessarily when it's super easy to fix them. It's literally just a matter of like a couple little tweaks and you're good. Yeah. And I would say usually, I mean, I'm sure you advise your clients to monitor their blood sugars. And so if you're monitoring your blood sugars, you can tell what you're like. I know um, when I would work with clients with diabetes, basically like some people, some of my clients could have apples and their blood sugars wouldn't spike and other people couldn't. So I'm sure it's very similar where it's like very individualized with the care where like some people's blood sugars will be affected, but you don't know until you test. So that's why monitoring is so important. Or the people with the continuous monitors where you can see it every five minutes pop up with another number. Those are game changers. Which is really cool. Like, I definitely want to talk about, like, the technology and how it's advancing and, you know, what people, if they are type 1 or type 2, maybe things that they could look into getting. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely want to talk about that at the end. But just to kind of go back to to the protein, how it could raise blood sugars, um, what about fats? So fats are a little unique. So, I mean, you're not going to most likely be eating fat in isolation. And if you do more props to you. Um, oh, hello. Yeah. What do you mean? People who do like bulletproof coffee, like coffee. outside of that, I'm talking like, you're not going to just go over and just like eat a scoop of mayo. Like that's what I'm saying. Oh yeah. Like bulletproof coffee be the only exception, but then you're confounding it with the coffee and the caffeine. And that's going to oh, eventually, uh-huh. yeah. that's a whole nother can of worms. So yeah. But outside of that, I mean, you're not going to go get a stick of butter and just start eating it. If you do, mad props. But um, (laughs) but, um, fat is mainly 
so fat with protein has a little bit of an effect, but fat with carbs is where you really see the effect because what it will do is it'll slow down your gastric emptying. So it'll slow down your digestion. And ultimately because it's slowing down your digestion, it's slowing the release of the carbs into your bloodstream. So what'll happen is if you eat, let's say a pasta dish with a, like a creamy sauce where you've got a bunch of fat, your blood sugar will spike from the, the carbs, but then there's a chance your blood sugar will just sustain and just sit high for hours because the fat is slowing everything down so much. Interesting. So that is, there's actually a feature on insulin pumps called the dual wave bolus, where you give a bunch of insulin up front and then a bunch of insulin over a specified period of time to try to combat things like that. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. So pizza is another example. People are like, pizza is the nightmare from hell for diabetes because you go up from the pizza and it's usually like the white flour and then suddenly you you sit high for hours and hours and hours. Wow. And I'm not saying it's impossible by any means. And if you know exactly what you're eating, then you're probably in a good spot. But those times where you go to say, hey, with your friends, I want to eat a whole pizza, that could be very a very difficult day of blood sugars for you. Okay. And so what would you recommend to someone who did want to eat pizza? If they do want to eat pizza? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I would recommend definitely doing so. I wouldn't say restrict the pizza. Pizza is a bad food. There's no good and bad food, but I would say be aware of where your blood sugars are, be aware of your dosing of your insulin, and then make sure that you're intervening at some point. If you notice your blood sugars are higher two, three hours later. And if your blood sugar is not coming down, just be aware that's probably the fat and you may need to be a little, you may need some more insulin than you typically would just take for just the carbs of the pizza. Mm-hmm. Even Would though you you're just having some- them to eat maybe less pizza? I mean, I'm not going to tell them not to eat tons of pizza, but if they're like, hey, I want to eat three pieces of pizza, by all means, go for it if you dose appropriately and you have a plan to make sure your blood sugar doesn't sit at 300 for hours. Mm-hmm. If you're going to go to 300 and sit there for hours, I'm going to advise you to have one piece of pizza. Right, exactly. But if, you, if you have no plan, if you have a plan and you know what you're doing or like you're under, like we're working together or something like that and we have something developed together, I have no problem with that as long as we know what we're doing going in. Mm-hmm. So it's not a guessing game where like, oh, I just was 350 for the last three hours. Why do I feel so awful? Right. And what would, so when someone um, does have like elevated blood sugars and say they're at 350, what symptoms would they feel at that point? Cool. Well, you feel thirsty. You feel very thirsty. It's just like almost the same symptoms as diagnosis. Thirsty, you're peeing a lot. You're kind of not friendly is a nice way of putting it. Um, you're usually really tired. Like you're really lethargic. You want to just nap all the time and you can't focus very well. And it just, I mean, these are pretty common symptoms across the board of the people I've worked with, the people I've talked to, and then myself. Mm. So it's not fun at all. No, it's not. The longer you sit high, the more nauseous you end up feeling usually too. Oh God. So then eventually you get into the possibility if you're not staying hydrated enough, there's that possibility if your number creeps up and you end up with ketones, that can be a whole nother ball of wax. Right. Because then what happens with, so, okay. Can, do you feel like you could talk about, like, I don't know, because I think people think that diabetic ketoacidosis and, like, going on a keto diet are, like, the same or similar or not. I don't know what people think. So can we, like, okay, let's, you, I don't even know what I'm asking, but, like, I've heard it, so I'm asking you, and I think you know how to answer it. <laughs> so diabetic ketoacidosis and the keto diet are not the same thing, but the ketones involved are the same thing. It's just a different context. So. Okay. Ketone bodies are when fat breaks down into an energy source that you can use. And basically what happens is when your people are diagnosed with diabetes, insulin is kind of like the key that lets the glucose into the cell. Mm -hmm. And so there's no insulin around. So your body says, okay, great. There's a bunch of sugar just floating around locked in. I can't do anything. If you break down protein, that just turns into glucose. So that doesn't help the problem at all. And so then your body says, well, I still have fat. I can go break down some fat. And that doesn't need insulin to be used as energy. So it starts breaking down that. So you make these ketone bodies. And so when people are in diabetic ketoacidosis, what's happening is usually there's an absence of insulin, kind of like when you're diagnosed, or there's an illness, an infection, or their blood sugar has been really, really high for a really long time, which usually, again, goes back to the lack of insulin. They're getting really dehydrated, and they can't 
they, they need energy somehow. So they start breaking down the fat into ketones to use and you start feeling horrendous. I mean, you start feeling disgusting. You're very nauseous. And a lot of the time for diabetic ketoacidosis, people are throwing up and they're like really dehydrated. Their blood sugars aren't coming down. They almost get glucose toxicity, which is where you have so much glucose in your blood that it would take extra, extra insulin to get your blood sugar down. And ultimately, if you're not going to get fluid, like if you, a lot of people end up in the hospital because they need IV fluid, they can't hold any fluid down. And if their blood sugar doesn't come down, they could eventually die. So that's very serious. On the flip side, the keto diet is literally these fat bodies. You're, you're not eating carbs. And so your body's saying, okay, you're eating fat. You're eating some protein, but you're mainly eating fat. Well, the fat doesn't really break down into glucose very efficiently at all. I think it's just like maybe 10% of the fat can even break down into glucose. Um, but then the rest of it says, okay, I can break down in these ketone bodies. My body can still use them as energy. So I'm going to use these. So it's the same ketone, but it's just a different context of where it's coming from. Okay. And so now what would you say to someone who wanted to do the ketogenic diet and they have, because maybe they were told they're pre-diabetic or they are have diabetes or they, you know, and they feel like that they should, because they heard that low carb or no carb is best or what they think is best and they cho choose to do that. What would you say to them? I mean, I've had people on the keto diet before. I've had people on low carb and I ask people to give me a good reason why. Because if you can't give me a good reason why, then I'm, if they're like, oh, well, I just heard it was cool, then okay, cool. But what I'm telling you is also cool and it will work. So why are you disputing it? But if they're like adamant and they've looked up their stuff and they're really interested in doing it and they're committed to doing it, because you and I both know how hard it is to get on the keto diet, sustain the keto diet for long term and all that, then I say, okay, we'll go ahead and do it. Here's what you're getting yourself into. And I actually have a couple IGTV episodes that are based around the keto diet, the good, bad, and ugly. And, um, they're all in the context of diabetes, like what's good about and what could be beneficial for blood sugar, but also what else to be aware of. So um, I have no problem with it. I don't do it myself. But if someone were to come to me and want to do it, if they're committed and they're not going to just pansy out, then I'm fine with it. Right. Because anything works if you stick to it. Um, and so also like being, you know, the good part about keto, I'm sure is in your video is that they're probably eliminating a lot of maybe the things they were having in excess, like the sugar in their coffee, you know, the extra donut in the morning or whatever, like in general, I think it's a good starting point. But like you said, you can help them to control their blood sugars in a way where carbohydrates can fit. So why kind of go that route if you don't have to? Well, and some people just, I think, and this is my school of thought and some people have a different one, but I believe that everybody has, is on a spectrum of energy for between fat and carbs. There's the fat end of the spectrum, the carb end of the spectrum. Most of us are somewhere in the middle, but some people run better on fat. So if they say, Hey, I'm feeling really good on keto and that's what they want to do. And they feel good. They feel full. They feel like they have energy. Then by all means, they may have discovered where they're, they feel the best at. But a lot of people I tend to find are somewhere in the middle as, and some people are more carb heavy and they're like, oh, I'm feeling great on carbs. By all means, I have friends that eat 500 carbs a day and people I've worked with that eat 400 carbs a day and they're doing, they're thriving with diabetes. Right. And then people who are on 30 carbs a day that are thriving with diabetes and they're both, their blood sugars are the same. It's literally about what matters. And what matters is what works for you. Yeah, totally. I think, yeah. And so kind of just to backtrack a little, I don't want anybody to feel confused where we were saying about like, you know, about the different things that happen, like when we consume carbs, how we consume protein, when we consume fats. I think at the end of the day, not one is better than the other. They all matter. You just have to figure out how much of each and the type of each that you're going to apply to your lifestyle. And it goes back and I, and I hate to be redundant, but I mean, I, I feel like on every interview and even when I do my solo episodes, the same thing comes up and it's like, it depends. Like the dietitian's like classic answer is it depends, but it's because it's true because everyone is so unique. Our bodies are unique. Our lifestyles are unique. Our jobs are unique. Our, our, our relationship with food is unique. And so you have to figure out what fits best for you and your lifestyle. And then also, especially if you have a medical condition, what fits to help control and, you know, um, diminish the complications of that diagnosis. So 
it's twofold. It's always about, okay, people come to me, they want to lose weight or they want to get strong, but it's okay. How can we do that while keeping your blood sugars happy? Exactly. Gosh, it's hard enough without diabetes. I can't even imagine. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge, but at the same time, I like it. So I would love to get rid of it. I'd love you said, Hey, diabetes got cured today. I'd say, great, sign me up. But at the same time, I mean, it's definitely, it's like a puzzle to me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anybody has their blood sugars and understanding of diabetes under control, it's definitely you. Like I would say if anybody is, what's your name on Instagram? My name on Instagram is man of zeal. So M A N O F T Z E E L. Yeah. I mean, I just love how transparent you are with your posts and on your story. You're always, always sharing about like where your blood sugars are at, what you're going to do about it, how you test the annoying part of testing, but why you do it. And even, I mean, you are, you work out regularly, right? You, you know, um, you have a girlfriend, so it's not like you're, you know, just staying home and just like figuring this out on your own. Like you socialize, obviously, yeah, you no, know, not like, some weirdo that's like in a room by themselves, like huddled over the computer. Yeah, you're very social. Like you go, I mean, so, I mean, yeah, I would just say if anybody is looking to learn, um, just follow you on Instagram. I'm going to put your, I always put everyone's name in the show notes, but so thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. But, um, I just quickly, I want to mention, talk about like how technology has kind of changed and like what people could get to regulate their blood sugars. If they don't, are they not aware of it or what's coming down the pipeline? Um, okay. we'll kind of wrap up with like last minute things. Absolutely. So you want all of the new tech or just like the main ones that people are using right now? Probably the main ones that that you would recommend that people are using right now and like the perks of it. All right. So I've got insulin pump right here. It's attached to me, as you can see from this wire. Mm -hmm. And um, basically what it does is instead of having to inject all the time, especially for type ones, but instead of having to constantly be injecting every time you're eating a meal, having a long, um, like a long term insulin in terms of like long acting, that's the word, long acting insulin every single day. In addition to those injections, this is continuously pumping a little basal amount of insulin into me every hour. And then when I take in, um, I have a meal, I just bolus, I enter how many carbs I'm eating. It'll give me the insulin for me. And I have to take the in one injection for my site every three days. Wow. So that's, it can be really convenient. There are downfalls every, to everything, of course. Like there are times where if your site doesn't work or something has some sort of issue, but for the most part, it works really, really well. And it makes life a heck of a lot easier. You can do those extended insulin boluses I was talking about earlier um, for like the higher fat foods or the higher protein foods potentially. And it makes a lot of people's lives easier. There's one that doesn't have a wire. So people don't like wires. There's one that you can put like on your arm um, called an Omnipod. That one's pretty great. But that I think is a big one. And the other thing is there's, I'm going to pull up on my phone because I have it. There is a, oh, this is good there's a continuous glucose monitor. So every five minutes it's reading. Oh, nice. And so you can you literally see on your phone. Yeah. So it, it reads to the phone. You literally have it right there. And then I'm flipping it to the side. So you yes. can see it. Sorry. I'm a good model diabetic photo for you. Like the last 12 yeah. hours. Under 12, well, there's 200. <laughs> under 160 fam. Yeah. It's hard yeah, to like see, but I can, can, oh Yeah. You can do six hours, three hours, one hour, and it gives you trends. And then there's a whole thing you can do with there's on the app. It'll take all the data and compile it for you and say, hey, how's your last 48 hours? How's your last day? How's your last seven days? And it will show you all sorts of details on how's it been compared to last week and stuff like that. So you can really use this technology in that case to make a huge, huge difference in your care. I would say the continuous glucose monitor, if you had to pick between that or a pump, I would pick the continuous glucose monitor. Because, because do, you think, do you not have to check, like, I know, like, old school, you check your finger. You don't have to prick. Nice. So you literally don't have to prick your finger, which I have that over there. But um, you don't have to prick. It's reading all the time. You have tons of data. And so you know, you see the trend. If it's going up, it'll have an arrow up. If it's going down, it'll have an arrow down. So you can, you can see the trend and ultimately intervene. And even this particular pump, if it sees your blood sugar going up, it will, or not up, if you see it going down, it will turn off your insulin for you because it doesn't want you to go low. So there's predictive modeling that these pumps are starting to come out with. They're starting to become closed loop systems with these pumps where 
They'll communicate with the continuous glucose monitor and ultimately dose some of your insulin for you. So you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the, it's a lot of automation. A lot of the human work is getting taken out, but obviously they're still working on it. They're still perfecting it. Um, but for the time being, I mean, it's, it's come a long way, even from when I was diagnosed. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just, I remember growing up and having like an uncle with diabetes and watching him prick his finger and having to, you know, wait for it to go on the monitor and like read it. And this just seems a lot more efficient. Well, my first meter was like this big. Yeah. They're a lot bigger too. And it had like, you needed like to gouge yourself to get enough blood. And there was like an ad ticker on the bottom. because it took a minute to read your blood sugar. Oh my gosh. And now I'm here with a meter that if it takes more than four seconds, I'm ready to throw it out a window. (laughs) And I have someone that tests it for me every five minutes. I'm just, it's amazing how far we've come and even just. It's so cool. It's so cool. All right. So going off that last couple of questions, they just kind of came to me. Um, If you've noticed that your blood sugars are super low, what would you do to increase them? Like to treat a low blood sugar? I mean, the the easy answer would just say eat some carbs, especially Mm -hmm. faster acting carbs where people really gravitate towards juice, Gatorade. I feel like a lot of people do like orange juice. Orange. I mean, I I honestly hate juice because it was thrown at me so much as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of people do Skittles, Starburst. I don't love Starburst because they're really chewy. So as long as it takes me a while to eat them. Mm -hmm. Um, My underrated low snack is candy corn because it's disgusting. So you'll never overeat it because when you're low, you want to eat everything in sight. Candy corn, you will not overeat because it is overpoweringly sweet. Yeah. you get so you your nine sugar, pieces, but you don't want to have too much sugar because then you can go back. You can go into hyper. Then you, go, then you go really high with your blood sugar, and then you have to correct it, and then you go down, and then you have to eat, and that's how people gain weight with diabetes. Insulin does not cause weight gain. That's my plug. I do on everything. Insulin does not cause weight gain. Got it. Got it. Repeat. <laughs> Another rewind. Yeah. Um, which oh god, now I have more questions about that because I feel like everyone hears insulin is like oh insulin stores fat. And so, but well, that could be another episode. Don't worry. I would love to sound off on that. Yeah. Excess calories, just to like clarify people, excess calories stores fat. Gets, that's how you get, that's how you gain weight. Excess calories. Yeah. Although when you eat carbs, insulin will come out and technically it helps with your fat storage, but it doesn't automatically just make you gain all this weight. Well, people can gain weight on keto without any insulin. Right, because they're excess calories. Because there's other ways to store fat besides just insulin, because your body's really smart. But that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, totally. Um, but, okay, so how would someone, if their blood sugars are super high, so maybe they are testing, um, how would they get it down without insulin? With okay, so if their blood sugar's yeah. high and insulin's out of the equation, they've already dosed or whatever it is. Yeah. Hydrate. Hydrate or dihydrate, in the words of Tony Castillo. Yeah, he was uh, on. This will be out. He will probably, if, when this comes out, he'll be on the month before. Okay, yeah. So, so real talk, though. Hydration is hugely important because that in itself can honestly start the blood sugar dropping process because um, you're obviously trying to pee out the extra glucose. And in addition, I could go into a really long convoluted thing about basically how your blood sugar is a concentration. And if you increase your blood volume with more water, it should ultimately lower because it'll lower the concentration a little bit, but basically drink a ton of water. And if you are under two fifty ish, you could do really light activity, like go for a walk, walk around the block, walk around your house, go up a few stairs that should hopefully increase your insulin sensitivity a little bit and maybe start kickstarting your blood sugar to come down. But again, don't go do some sort of heavy weightlifting activity. or anything. Go up. If it you're, could go up. Yeah. So like a light walk and hydrate, would they eat anything? Would they eat like a protein or a fat or something? I mean, if it's a meal time and you have to eat, I mean, I would try to focus on a lower carb meal, but at the same time, ideally you're not eating until your blood sugar is at least. Right, trend- so don't eat until it's down. I, I'm not saying a hundred percent don't, but I would definitely be very aware of what you're choosing to eat. Like don't decide that that's going to be your time to eat pizza. Cause that's probably not going to go very well. Gotcha. That makes sense. That makes sense for sure. Um, Okay. And so the last question, I actually um, got it in my Facebook group and I already answered, but I just want to hear how you would answer. I love doing this. I love knowing if I'm like saying the right thing when the expert in the field comes on about the topic. Um, So let's talk about 
when something on a package and it says it like advertises it and it says like six grams of net carbs, right? Right. So the question that I've gotten is, do you count, does that mean that like, say it has 30 grams of carbohydrate, but it, it's only six grams of net carbs. Do you like not count the 30 grams? Do you count only the net carbs? For blood sugar purposes or for life? Both. I mean, blood sugar wise, I would tell them to look at the things that are being counted in the net carb equation, which are typically fiber and sugar alcohol. And if it's fiber, again, it's something we have to check on the kind of fiber. It gets really complex. I just tell people subtract the fiber. So if it's 30 grams of carbs and there's 15 grams of fiber, you're now at 15 grams of carbs. And if there happens to be sugar alcohol in there, that's something where depending on what it is, it still can impact your blood sugar. So a lot of people will say to treat that as half of the amount of carbs. So if there's 10 grams of sugar alcohol, you might treat that as five. So and then you enter it, when you enter it, say you're tracking on my fitness pal mm-hmm. and you're like, this is not someone with diabetes. You so would a tell normal person. a normal person. You would tell them to enter it as less carbs than it says on the package. I would not less. I would never have them do less, but I was going to say in that case, if they say it's that because they're subtracting the sugar alcohol and they're subtracting the fiber, I would have them have the sugar alcohol and then get rid minus the fiber. So it might be slightly higher, but that's because I'm looking at it from a blood sugar perspective. If, if you tell me it's 30 carbs, so you would actually add to that to the net carbs, you know, just the carbs in general. Oh no, no, no. no. If, if the package says it is 30 grams of carbs, the most it will possibly be is 30. And if it says six grams of net carbs, the least it will be is six. Okay. More than likely it is somewhere in between that range for the true answer. But more, but again, from like, if I was looking at it, like I have these high fiber tortillas, they're 19 grams of carbs, 13 grams of fiber. I would count that as six. Six grams of carbs. Because if I can tell you, if I dose for 19, I'm done for. Okay. So if you're diabetic, then that's something you would count. But if Absolutely. regular for a regular person, you would tell them it'd be less, or would you tell them it'd be the same? I would still count that as six. Really? If you tell me cauliflower is 10 grams of carbs and seven grams of fiber, I'm counting that as three grams of carbs. Really? I don't do that. I don't tell people. I'm not that. saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that that's, that's what I've done in, in my I experience. Just tell people to, I just tell people that, Basically, it's a good thing that if something is, has carbs, it also has fiber. It, it should mostly because carbs come from the ground. And if it comes from the ground, it should be in its whole form unless you need it for simple purposes, like mm. pre-workout or something like that. Right. But, so it just means that it's a good source, but, you know, it's still the same amount of carbohydrates. I'm just saying, I mean, I, I think people look at net carbs because they're always talking about it in the context of your blood sugar. It's how much net is going to impact your blood sugar theoretically versus like how much like okay so if you're tracking say you're tracking your macros you still count i so just to clarify i feel like you should still if you're tracking your macros it's still 30 grams of carbohydrate Mm -hmm. but the chip but it's gonna affect if it has fiber it's gonna not it won't affect your blood sugars as much as say 30 grams of carbohydrates from fruit juice yeah, if you if you put in my fitness pal, this is a better way of putting it. If you put in my fitness pal and your daily carb goal is hundred gram, that's really low, two hundred grams of carbs, and you eat something that has thirty grams of carbs and nineteen grams of fiber, that thirty is still counting towards your two hundred. Yeah. Okay. But if you then tell me how many carbs did you eat today, I'm gonna look at you and look at your two hundred, subtract your fiber and say I ate a hundred and whatever grams. Interesting. That's just how I've always done it. It seems to work, but I can tell you in terms of like my brief keto experience I had, God, years ago, I could get in ketosis on like 35, 40 grams of net carbs. Hmm. So that's why I didn't believe in net carbs necessarily before. Like I'd say, okay, I'm going to use it for dosing. But in terms of actual using them, I was eating like 80 grams of carbs by the definition you use, but I was still in ketosis because of the net. Interesting. Okay. Because think about it, if it's, if it's carbs that aren't impacting your blood sugar, they're not really being converted to glucose, they're not going to ultimately kick you out of ketosis. Right, right. So I guess the takeaway for that is just try to choose carbs that have fiber. 
yeah, choose fibrous carbs and be aware of where the fiber comes from and be aware of what you're eating. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Anything else you feel like we need to talk about or talk or touch on? Well, I feel like we need a whole episode about insulin and weight gain and how it's complete BS, but I have a great video. It's about a minute long that will tell you everything you need to know in a minute on my Instagram. If you scroll back a little bit. Okay. Or just have like, guys, just message Ben. If you want to see that video, you can't find it. The message me. It's not that far back. It's me. And then my friend, Chris, and he's another person in the diabetes space who does a lot of nutrition type of stuff. And right. we're having a, having a good time about the insulin and insulin does not cause weight gain. Fact. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. How would people find you if they want to get in touch with you? People can find me on Instagram at man of zeal, which I believe you're putting in the description somewhere. And my website is your diabetes insider.com. You can get a hold of me on there as well. Perfect. All right, Ben, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, Tony, for having me. My pleasure. All right, guys, was that not so much information? I hope you're not overwhelmed. Even as I was going through it with him, I'm like, once again, the RDs contradicting each other, contradicting the science. It never quite makes sense. However, you guys know that there is no one size fits all approach to nutrition. Um, it really does require some individualized care. With that being said, I hope you still found this informative and educational. And if you like the episode, please screenshot it, share it on your story, tag me, ten, tag Ben. Let us know that that resonated with you. If you're not subscribed to the Tips with Tony podcast, please subscribe. It allows other people to find the podcast, basically spread our message and help people get healthy one bite at a time, which you know is my slogan. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. I really, really appreciate the support. You absolutely have no idea how much it means to me. So with that, I just want to leave you and say thank you. Have a great day.